people might disagree, but in my perspective or my reading, this was a major factor. You know, in India, especially in the 80s, it's changed dramatically now. But in the 80s, even in the 90s, the concept of sitting on a com computer and doing something meant typing. And typing was done by a typist. It's a much lower level job. So you can't have an officer who sits on the computer and works. So you will get some years, you will never use that device. And therefore, this perspective of a sort of feudal hierarchy, where it is defined by who does what job, really killed it. And you can see the contrast today. Today you walk into almost any office, and I'm not talking of just the corporate sector, even the government offices, I see person after person, very senior persons, sitting and looking at their mail, you know, they may not type out essays, but they send responses themselves, they're familiar with it, they look at it. Complete change. It's no longer seen as something which is in some sense inferior, that why should I do this? But in the 80s, because you had not gone through that basic change in what you might call the sociology and the organization, or insufficient training for these people to feel excited and interested about what this new technology can do, it became a device that was not used. And that, I think, is drawing from the important part of the governance system when you introduce technology. That unless you are able to get people to first change the mindset in terms of how they use it, second, get them familiar enough to be able to actually, if not use it themselves, to be able to guide somebody or tell them I want this. You don't have to guide somebody, you don't have to know how the computer works, but you should be able to know enough to say, I want this done. And you should know that it can be done. I think that's the second part of what it is. And the third one, very importantly, I think, is that when you get in something like this, any technology, you have to see what the total, you might call it the ecosystem or what I called earlier processes are that need to be changed. Once you do that, things begin to And there are ways and ways of doing it. Let me step back a bit and now talk of technology as being, you know, give it illustrations of computers. But to me, technology is not just the hardware. It's the whole elemental range of things which you do to make something happen. If you might say it like the technology of doing, you know, uh, pro producing some chemicals. There's a lot of hardware, but there are also certain processes and formulas which then give you the end product. So it's a combination of those. And I think there, when you begin to look at some of the innovations that technology can and has brought in, you begin to see how you can bring value to changes. Let me give you one example. And this is from Andhra Pradesh 10, 12 years back, or 10 years ago. When they took a conscious decision not only to begin to use information technology for a whole host of government services or citizen services, but they changed the, what you might call the business model. They said, instead of the government doing this, we will get an entrepreneur to do this. And we will work the system in such a way that the entrepreneur has an incentive to do this and to do it well. So what they did was computerize a number of government services that interface with the citizen and told the citizen you can pay your electricity bill, your water bill, telephone bill, you can apply for a whole host of things that you need to do, you can apply for a passport, you can pay your property tax, you can do a whole range of these things on computer, they've got everything computerized. And to do this, you've got to go, you need not have a computer obviously, you can, and you need not even know how to use a computer. All you need to do is to go to a center where they will do it all for you. You go with your bill and you give them, pay the money and they will do all the processing and give you a receipt. Now this could have been done in the traditional way which would have been the natural mindset of old in the government saying we'll set up a place, we'll set up an office, people will come, there'll be a counter across the window, you go, as many of us do in many offices today, you give your paper and a bill and then he does. The problem with that is that in the given government system, which will change one day but today it's not, it's basically a five day or six day week which is nine to five, you might have a few people working extra time, you may not, working day is difficult. There's no great incentive for them. They're on a long-term permanent job with fixed salaries. Giving incentives is very difficult. So the Andhra Pradesh government decided to do it a different way. They said, we will get this whole thing done by a private party. The government will hold the data. The government will computerize it. They will hold the database. But we will get the front-end service, so to say, citizen-facing service, where you provide actual service to a private party. Now, the minute you do that, you begin to see, and most importantly, the model was based on saying we will pay the private party on the basis of number of transactions. So every time somebody went and paid a bill, the private party would get a fixed amount. 
So immediately you can see that there's an incentive for that private party to make sure that more people come and they use this because they didn't go down the audit of the government doing it or walking to your electricity office for us and then your telephone bill and going to property tax payment. But this place was a single window where you could do all that you wanted to do. Now the fact that they did this gave the private guy a great incentive. Within three months, all of them had set up very nice places, not too large, somewhere reasonably big. I've seen one place which is almost as big as this. All air conditioned, chairs to sit on, water cooler, magazines. It's like the lobby of frankly, uh, it's not a five star, a three star or four star hotel. You walk in there, you go there, there's hardly any queue, but if there's a queue, you're given a number, and you wait, sit comfortably, read a magazine, do whatever you want. And the number flashes on this on the display and you go go to the counter only then, so then you sit, you don't have to stand in the You go and give all your bills on the spot with a check or cash and you get a printed receipt because yet in India, this was important, you say yes, it's all done, it's not done, I want some proof. So you get a printed receipt then. You can pay all your bills in one place and do it there. Now once this began to happen, in order to get more people coming, the private party very quickly realized that many people want to pay the bill not in office time, they can't come. Some people may move off, but most people can't. So if you want to make this work and get more people, you have to keep it open beyond normal office hours. So they started keeping it open till 8 in the night. They opened on Sundays. And within 6 months, these places were operating from 8 in the morning to 8 at night, including on Sundays. And 80% of bills in 6 months were being paid only through this system. And this private party had become viable already in the space of six months, having set up a huge infrastructure including a nice air conditioned place and chairs and water and magazines, it became community viable. I think it's one example of use of technology and governance in a way which combines technology with a change in the process and the business model. The process change was you could pay all your bills in a single window. The business model was you got a private party and then you incentivize that private party to make sure more people come. No fixed payment, you pay him a fixed amount and give him a contract, he also will just sit back and wait, saying I am getting my money, why should I go? Here he had to do something to get more. But when I give you this example, and some of you at least are old enough to remember that, think back of an earlier example, which really triggered this thought in the Andhra government. You will remember that in the old days, ancient days, which very few of you remember, if you had a phone at home, you put the trunk call and waited. If you didn't have a phone at home or without a order, which happened very often, you went to the post office and then tried to make a call from there. Even if you wanted to make a local call, you went to the PCO or the post office. The post office is, as you know, closed on Sundays, open 9 to 5. And slowly as STD came in, and even the trunk call days, the rates are lower at night because traffic is less. After 11 is the lowest, after 8 o'clock is half or one third, whatever it was in those days. But if you want to go at night when it's cheapest, you can't because there's no open facility. So if you're a young person staying in a hostel and want to call your friends or want to call home, you have to call in the daytime because at night you can't go anywhere else. The place you could access, which is the post office, is closed. So you will remember now from the what, 70s or 80s probably, 80s, the so-called STD, ISD, PCOs which opened up all over the country. Because someone, and this was Sam Petroda in the 80s working with Again, Rajiv Gandhi made this suggestion that let's allow individual entrepreneurs to set up this. The telephone department will own the system, but they'll give this phone line to them. Let them set up a little small booth somewhere in the local market or shop or wherever and let them run it. And these people very obviously on day one realize that maximum traffic will come late night, so they used to stay open, if any of you have gone there, till midnight. Because that's when you get a lot of student traffic, a lot of people who want to save some money, or a lot of people just feel it's a waste of money calling the day, I'll call it night. And they made sure the phone worked. And I've seen this time and again, even in the 90s in Delhi, I've often had to use that facility because my home phone line is down and it's down for one or two days. That guy's line is working. Obviously he had his own method of making sure his line didn't work. In the case you might know what that is. But he had an incentive to make sure it worked. Because if it worked, he got business. If it didn't work, he may or may not have had an incentive to make sure my life was out of order, but that's a different story. But his line always worked, and you went there. And this was the start of changing the concept of both use of technology, but more importantly, or equally importantly, how you can re-gear the total system so that it's not just technology, but you make it in a way 
that there's an incentive for the service provider to provide better and good service. And to me, that's a very, very important lesson in governance. Because when you use technology, it's not just, and that's why I said earlier, I'll come back to the transparency and not the beauty part. Those are obviously key elements, and you can't do without them. They're what you would call hygiene. That can be there. But beyond that, you do need something that is more service oriented, that you as a user, you as a consumer, you as a citizen, want to get better service. And that service may mean odd times of the day, it may mean something special, it may mean going on Sunday because you're busy other days, and you want that service. And one way of doing it, and I wouldn't pretend it's the only way by giving you two examples of private initiative, it's not necessarily the only way, there could be other ways. But this is one way which has been very, very successful in time. We're going to give you an interesting cycle I go on what happens also when you have this sort of initiatives. You know, in the 90s, one thought was taking off from the telephones, and before the Andhra Pradesh example that I gave you, one of the states, Madhya Pradesh, might surprise you now, but Madhya Pradesh is a pioneer in this in those days, a very fast sighted chief minister there again, like Andhra, which had Chandrakov and I do. In those days, with Deep Vijay Singh, he had some vision, but importantly, also, he had some very, very good administrators working with him. And they took on this thing of saying, as Rajiv Gandhi introduced computers, we will use the computer for providing certain what we call play citizen services. Today it's gone way, way ahead and I'll come back to the present. But those days there were few services that could be provided. But they were very key. So they set up a few of these computers in villages to provide services to citizens which the government you know, provide. Maybe a form, downloading a form, applying for something. So the same kind of thing which we see today and talk about. In many villages they set it up as something which the government did in the panchayat building with somebody looking after it who got some training in it. In a few cases, they tried the experiment of getting a private entrepreneur saying, you know, we'll give this to you, we'll make the investment, you run it, operating cost and how it operates is, is your care. If you make money on it, good. But we will not subsidize if you run it. After a while, they found that it was useful but not very useful because, frankly, there were too few services on it. So, you know, if, if you have to download a form for a loan in a village, there's one computer you go, how many people want to take a loan at a given time? Know, in the course of a week, you might get two people. And this, this guy charges a small fee, it's not viable. And the entrepreneur found that out very soon, that you know, doing these services from the government, which is applying for this, that it's just not viable. He was not able to make any money. So he said he needs to make at least, even in those days, you know, 3,000 rupees a month to get something. Many of them wound up and told the government, sorry, this is not working, we can't do it. But one of them made a great success of it. I'm very intrigued. You know, they're telling this one place is working. You know, he's actually happy. He tells us he's making four, five thousand rupees a month, and we're going to go and see what exactly answer and you want to come. So I went along with them. This little village, which was outside Thar, and we went there, talked with them, and chatted. He was very excited doing business, and there's some people come and so on to make good business. And what do you make your money on? There can't be enough stuff in giving. You know, downloading forms. Here, they had had a print also, printing some of them and doing this. So you know what he had done? He had figured out the local need. This is the responsiveness part of governments, you might say, in a very different way, not, way which I'm not very really happy with, but that's the idea it work. He found that a great need for the villagers was matching horoscopes for weddings with somebody particular from other villages. So this guy first started collecting horoscopes from the 10 villages around. And this is very, as, as you all know, in India, particularly in rural areas, very much based on caste and community. So you're looking for somebody who's there and yet not related, all the constraints and all the things that are there. So he collected these horoscopes and provided this as a service to people. Then he went one step more and started making horoscopes. You give him the date of birth and the time of birth and you produce horoscope. And he started doing this magic. And here he could charge a much higher fee. And he was a smart businessman. Today you would call it a success fee. So he not only charged for doing the horoscope and doing some matching, but if there was a success, the marriage took place, then you would yank up his fee by 10 times. He did a few marriages a month, that's all. That was enough. And he was, you know, making comfortable money. It's just one example, not just of the use of technology, but the responsiveness. I said, this is a bad example, I'm not very much for horoscopes. But how the need to respond to a market demand, good or bad, can help to take that forward. And the fact that he did this, again, for good or for bad, enabled him to continue to do a lot of work for other fewer but more important transactions in my view, at least for loans or forms and so on, which in most other villages they had to wind up because it was just not viable. So 
he was able to build a model that provided the core service based on what you might say cross subsidy coming from something which may or may not be so desirable. But I think it's an example of responsiveness and the need for responsiveness. Now, part of the responsiveness comes from the incentive which goes to an entrepreneur to do this in any way. And I think one of the things that we've got to give some thought to is how can you build such responsiveness in the government system where the direct incentive, or let me say not even direct, the monetary incentive to do this can doesn't exist or at best can be minimal. You know, some governments try to give something, but they really can't. The system doesn't allow you to give incentives to people who come up with such things. So one big challenge is that how do you make sure that the system which you've set up is responsive and reacts to local needs because many of these needs are very local. It's not something you can find out in your camera pills across the country or across the state. Not even a small state like Goa, it may be difficult. Some of the things may be very local. And so you need somebody who has that flexibility and the motivation to be able to respond immediately to a local need. And I think this certainly is one of the challenges. Let me move to some other examples of technology use. Somewhere I just leave the thoughts with you of some of the uses that are happening now. Again, a lot of examples from the past try and hopefully draw some lessons. But today, I think the scenario has changed radically. Today, we have a lot of technology that reaches very wide. There's a very, very big program called the Common Service Centers, which are being set up by government. They've set them up already in 100,000 villages, where your computers connected with even internet access, where you can link up, get increasing amounts of government services. There need to be more of them, but already a lot of the government services that you need, whatever you might do as a citizen, not just paying bills, but the whole host of other things are on it. There is a national e-governance program, very ambitious, very large, there are 31 so-called mission board projects, which are to be executed and done. Some of them deal with business-related situations. For example, there is one for corporate companies to file their returns, there's one for easy business where you can do your filing and the time to register a new company on an average has come down from something like two and a half months to seven days. This is actual statistics on an average. Sometimes it can be even quicker. So lots of things happening which are not widely reported. So many people think nothing's happening, government is slow, they're inefficient. It may be true, but I think we have seen a dramatic change through some of these. Today, passport, as you I don't know if any of you try to get one recently, it may not be here, but it's being rolled out now a whole called e-passport thing which has been semi-privatized, semi, a lot of it is yet in the government to build on the positives of the private to be able to get a passport quickly, you can apply online, get it done much, much quicker, uh, very transparent, you can track what, what stage it is and hopefully, I wouldn't say zero, but minimal corruption, zero is always a bit of difficult. So lots of such things coming up through the national e-governance program. There the big challenge is to, one, how can you put more services more quickly on? Today, one of the problems is that not all the services are online. The ones they started with first, frankly because they were easier, is the government to business kind, which serve companies. It's much easier to do and much more, you know, it's sort of low-hanging fruit and it's been very beneficial. But the citizen services are much more difficult. Also, many of the citizen services are state-specific. You can't do a central one for the each state has different rules and laws, so you've got to you know, make some changes there. Some of it is common, but some needs changes. So a lot of things which are being done there. But there is definitely a lot of forward movement on that. And the use of technology in this has become critical. The effort which many of us have tried to push is that the more critical part is to introduce technology in what you would call the back end, at the government end. At the citizen end, you don't want too much technology. Not everybody is familiar with computers and how to handle them and what to do, so you need simple systems. And one good example of that kind of thing is the so-called interactive voice response systems, IVRs. And there's something which many of you must have used. If you want to find out you know, train timings or railway reservation, or you're on the waiting list and have a number from the trains, you just call a function that tells you dial 1 for English, dial 2 for Hindi, press 1 for this, then press 2 for that service, then enter your whatever number, it tells you. This kind of thing is very simple for you to use. You just start following instruction and punch one or two numbers in. At the back end, it's very sophisticated and complicated. And I think that's one of the lessons that has increasingly come through. That when you use technology, especially in governance which deals with citizens, in a country particularly where many citizens are not so familiar with technology and a few are even completely illiterate, 
you need to make it very sensitive. It can't be a complex system that you will go and get it into a computer. And which is why I give you the example of Andhra Pradesh, where you as a citizen don't have to know anything about a computer. You just do your standard thing which you used to do earlier, except that instead of running around from you know telephone to property tax to electricity, you can take all your bills to one place. But other than that, you do nothing. You don't have to do anything. You take your bills, you take your money and pay them. Everything else is done by that person and the back end in the government. And I think that's an increasingly powerful lesson that you learn, that don't make the front end too complex. The interface with citizens must be simple. The next step that's happening now is to move such interfaces to the mobile. Because you know, there are more than 900 million mobiles in the country now. And there's some double counting, but certainly upwards of 700 million people actually own a mobile. And so if you can put more and more services on the mobile, which people are used to, they are handled it, they know it, even the person who is illiterate knows what to do with it. If there is a text, he or she may not be able to read it, but they can punch and stuff and do what to do. And so the stage of technology now, which is established technology, but it's being rolled out in some of these cases, is that even for information, you don't, even if you text it, you can transfer the text to voice. So as far as the person is concerned, he just puts it on and he hears a voice that tells them what to do or what the reaction is or what is done, which is like your IVRS from the telephone. Those kind of things which are moving from so-called e-governance to m-governance are also beginning to happen. There are a whole host of other applications which are really the grassroots which are also very exciting. You'd be familiar with the NREGA, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act or scheme, which provides employment to those who are completely destitute to all the work. Now one of the big problems there was the delay in payments. You know, somebody in a village does work and he used to be paid minimum of, used to be 100, now it's more a day, 120, 150 rupees a day. But the payment comes two, three